All right, welcome everybody. It's a it's a sunny Wednesday afternoon here in Cambridge, Beautiful. Massachusetts. We've just filmed uh, another Data Camp course. I'm Hugo Bowen Anderson, a data scientist at Data Camp. This is Peter Bull, data scientist and co-founder of Driven Data. That's right. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. This has been great, Hugo. Perhaps you can tell us a bit about yourself and about Driven Data, Peter. I'd love to. Yeah. So. Driven Data uh, is a company whose mission is to bring the power of data science to social enterprises, nonprofits, and NGOs. One of the big ways in which we do that is by running online machine learning competitions. So we have data scientists that are all over the world that come to our platform and they compete to solve these problems that have a social impact. We've done work in healthcare, we've done work in education, we've done work in international development, uh, and all of these data scientists through their skills, have contributed to making the world a better place. Fantastic. Maybe you can tell us a bit about the course that we've, we've just recorded as well. Yeah, I'd love to. So the course is really exciting. Uh, basically, it's a case study where what we do is we look at one of the competitions that we've run, and we walk through how the competition is set up, what this data set is like. It's a real world data set. It's got all of the edges and corners that a real data set has. And we look at how the person who won the competition actually used a couple of different methods, some tools, some tricks, uh, some statistical methods, um, some computational things, put it all together and came up with the best solution. And what we really want to do is show the students how they can use some of these same tools and that really by combining them in the right scenarios can make really effective machine learning models. Great. Do you think you could delve very briefly into the types of tools? Because we don't want to give too much of the game away. Sure, but sure. We want to at least whet your appetite out there. Yeah, so uh, really a, a big chunk of it is about natural language processing. There's some text data. This is from a school budget data set. Uh, so there's some text from these line items. But there are also a couple of numerical columns that have missing values. Uh, and so you sort of have to work with these very different kinds of data and get them to play together nicely in a model in order to get a great score. And then, because the data set's so large, there are a bunch of statistical and computational concerns that you need to address if you're going to build a good model for this data set. And so we really want to give this perspective of working with a real world problem and getting from this messy, complicated raw data to a really accurate prediction. Great. What language are we talking about and what, what packages will the, will our, our, our students learn. What yeah, about. so we work through uh, this whole course in Python, uh, and in particular, uh, we really focus on how you would approach this problem using the tools from Scikit-Learn. Uh, so with Scikit-Learn, you have a huge community that's building computational tools uh, in a way that is very rigorous, very well tested. Uh, and implements most of the really popular methods. And so one of the great things is that we can take the winning solution and pretty simply implement a lot of the tips and tricks from it in one-liners from Scikit-Learn. Uh, so we'll be working through, through that, uh, and we'll also use a couple things from the Pandas library uh, as we're loading our data. Fantastic. So uh, a, a potentially controversial question. Oh, um, great. Why Python? Uh, that's a good question. So part of it is about uh, the scikit-learn library. The access to a library that so consistently presents an API is really a huge benefit to people who are doing machine learning. Part of what you do when you're working on a machine learning problem is research and development. And as part of that, you need to make lots and lots of changes to how your code works and see how that affects your results. Because the scikit-learn API is so consistent, you can very easily swap in new methods. For example, you can pull out your logistic regression, put in a random forest, and basically that's one line change and you get a whole new model. Because you can do that so simply, you can much more quickly work through the different kinds of pre-processing and modeling choices that you might make in a problem. Great. Uh, and this, I suppose, leads into in another important question. We have a lot of people um, taking our courses and using the, pl the platform we, we have on DataCamp uh, who are starting out, mm. and, and they ask the question a lot, should I be looking at R? Should I be looking at Python? Are there other technologies um, I, I should be using? I don't want to set up um, 
that type of dichotomy per se. But what I'd like to know is why would you, uh, as a practicing data scientist, use use Python? Yeah. So um, one of the the big reasons that I personally use Python uh, is that there's a very close connection between the kinds of Python code that I write to do data science work uh, and the kinds of Python code that you might write for other software development. So a lot of our projects are about building larger pieces of software that have a machine learning component. And so the ability to build that larger software and do our machine learning in the same language makes that workflow so much easier. Mm. Um, so that's one of the big reasons that we focus on Python. But R is also a great language, uh, super powerful. And for our competitions, we see people submitting in both R and Python at almost equal numbers. Yeah, great. And I suppose this kind of gets to the heart of the matter of what perhaps a full stack data scientist would look like mm. at, at, some, at some level. So someone who you know, can build a web app, pipe, <clears throat> inputs to a database, then query it, put models in using, using Python, and all of that you can do uh, in, in, in Python. Yeah, all of that you can do very easily in Python, and uh, lots of those things are very actively supported by developer communities in Python. Yep. So one of the biggest considerations when picking a language is what the community of practitioners is like that you're going to be interacting with. Uh, that's one of the beauties of the R language is that there's such a robust community of statistical practitioners. Uh, but one of the really strong advantages of the Python language is that there's a really robust community of software engineers and developers that are supporting the other pieces of software that you're also going to build in Python. Mm. So in addition to having that statistical and data community in Python, which is also very strong, yep. you've got communities around web applications, for example, building the Django framework or the Flask framework. Absolutely. So something we're kind of dancing around here is the idea of what... Uh, data science is, or a definition mm. of data science, which I personally think is currently ill-defined in a number of respects. Something we try to do at, at Data Camp uh, with conversations such as, with people such as yourself, developers and practitioners uh, fr from around the world is trying to figure out what data science actually is. Yeah. So maybe you could give some insight into, as a practicing data scientist. Yeah, so really, uh, in my mind, I like to take as broad an approach as possible to defining data science. So I think a data scientist is sort of like a software engineer, where there are many, many, many different kinds of things they can be doing. Um, but a data scientist is really someone whose job it is to help other people learn from data. Uh, so that's everything from deciding which data to collect, uh, how to process that data before you store it, where and how to store that data, how to pull that data out of that database, how to then do some analysis on that data, whether it's uh, more simple statistical analysis, um, maybe you just need to know some trends, maybe you need to know things like um, the means and the standard deviations of particular things, or if it's more complex analysis, where maybe you're building a machine learning system and you have some predictions you want to make. Uh, and then at the other end of that, there's this big piece uh, about communicating what it means to have done some of this analysis. What are these results? Why are they important? How does it relate to some problem I'm having? How does it provide me with insight uh, when I'm trying to do my work? Uh, and so really, a data scientist can be involved at any point along that pipeline. And I think that uh, over time, data scientists are going to be more specialized into different parts of that pipeline, sort of in the way that you may have a back-end software engineer or a front-end software engineer. Um, but for the time being, really, I think the data science umbrella is welcoming anyone who cares about data and wants to use it to make things better. Great. So firstly, I agree completely with everything you just said. Um, and what we've pinpointed there is the data part of data science. So I'm interested also yeah. in what's scientific about it. And that, that may not be well defined either at this point. Yeah. So I don't think my, my personal view on that is that that is not well defined yet what uh, pieces of it are science and which pieces are engineering. Because mm. uh, as we described in the process, you have both engineering and science that's happening there. Um, so the scientific portion of data science uh, is really about um, the scientific method. It's about having hypotheses that you're trying to evaluate using the data that is you have on hand. Um, 
And I, I don't think that that is a rigorous criterion that you want to use for defining data science as a whole. I think data science involves a lot of engineering as well. Um, but I think just the history of the term means that we're calling it data science. But I don't think that that science portion uh, is really what's at the heart of it. I think the data is. Absolutely. Other people may disagree with that. Maybe yeah. you do. Yeah, well, no, I, I don't. As, as you say, there are portions of it which, which can involve hypothesis testing. There are also experiments you can do, like mm. A-B testing, That's a great example. point. So, you know, changing um, <clears throat> the location of a, bu a button on your website for some users um, to see uh, if that generates more clicks and doing some sort of statistical test um, with, with respect to the, the responses. But I, I do think that definitely is, is not an overarching theme of what, mm -hmm. what data science means or, or, or is. Um, but, but I think, right, it's partly history, that's where it comes from, yeah. is um, the term was uh, really coined in Silicon Valley to talk about people who were coming in as analysts and wanting to run those kinds of scientific experiments mm. like A-B testing, uh, and really has come to encompass this whole data science process we've talked about. Yeah. Um, and so I think the, the science part of the name um, is related to a lot of the work that happens in that um, a lot of the tools we use are the tools we use for scientific computing. Um, but that the scientific process itself uh, is only part of the data science process. Yeah. I suppose there's also the point, of course this is the same for software engineering in a lot of respects, but uh, the iterative uh, and kind of circular mm. process of the scientific method um, happens in data science a lot in terms of you know collecting data, then doing EDA, then building some models, then maybe going and finding some more data or going and cleaning it in a, in a different manner. And that's, that's a similar approach. Yeah, so I think that um, really data science activities are much more often research and development activities uh, than software engineering activities would be. Um, so, as you're saying, a lot of data science is about how do we figure out the best way to do something? How do we figure out if we can even solve this problem with the data we have? How do we figure out if we could ever solve this problem? Uh, and that is the, the sort of iterative question answering process of data science. That's really a research question because you don't know what the answer is yet uh, until you've really gotten in and executed that data science process, as mm. opposed to something like software engineering where you have a well understood architecture you're building towards. Absolutely. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of students and a lot of people on, on, on the platform who are budding data scientists. Mm. Um, and a, a question we, we, we get a lot is, uh, what type of things should I be looking at first? What's the best, best entry point uh, in, into data science? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, for me, uh, the best learning tools have always been working through real problems. Uh, so being able to understand how data science tools are being used in a real world setting. What is the business case for using data? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? Uh, and then using that motivation to look at the data science methods that might be effective in this scenario. So if I understand that um, I want to do something like predict customer churn, right? This is whether or not uh, a customer will stop being a subscriber to my business. Uh, I understand the business context of that already. I know that uh, we make money in this particular way. We have subscribers that fall off. We want to understand how and why that's happening. Uh, so now I can go and look, okay, how does a data scientist think about this problem? What are the tools for churn analysis and survival analysis that are out there? Uh, what packages implement these tools? How can I find tutorials and other materials that help me attack this particular problem I'm looking at? Uh, and really that kind of example-based learning uh, has been the most effective thing for me uh, in terms of really understanding uh, how to go from raw data to an answer. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I think Peter's humility um, would <clears throat> stop him from saying such a thing. But in terms of the case studies and, and examples he's talking about, I think Driven Data is, is an incredible place to, Thanks, to go. Yeah. Doing, doing these types of online competitions, there are vibrant communities of people, um, other people competing, providing feedback, uh, that, that type of stuff. So there's a, there's a lot happening. Yeah, and that's, that's part of our mission in setting up these competitions is to show people 
the kinds of problems that are data problems that they can be working on that also have a social impact. Uh, and so they're real data problems that you can learn from. Uh, we've done some of the pieces for you. They're set up to be supervised machine learning questions already. We're telling you about the context. We're telling you about the problem you're solving. And you get to do a lot of the really fun, really interesting parts of data science, right? You get to figure out what kind of model you're going to use, what kinds of pre-processing are going to be important. And all of those decision points, you get to make a submission, you get some feedback on how that changed your score, how mm -hmm. that changed your prediction accuracy. Uh, and that can help you learn as a data scientist to sort of see how those different approaches have an effect on your model accuracy. Absolutely. Uh, could, you, could you tell us about one particularly fun mm -hmm. competition that was hosted, not the one that we're, we've done in this course, but right. yeah. Yeah, so uh, actually last year we ran a really fun one with the city of Boston. So the city of Boston sends uh, health inspectors to restaurants, right? And those inspectors are looking for things like people aren't wearing their gloves or there's food that's not at the right temperature uh, or like these utensils need to be stored three feet away from the refrigerator, you know, these kinds of things that are part of the public health inspection checklist. Uh, and their, their process was to uh, basically use the knowledge of the inspectors they had to pick some restaurants to go to on a given day. They have a long list of facilities they need to get through over the course of a few months. Uh, and they would pick some that they wanted to go to in a given day. But the city was curious, could they use data to more effectively send inspectors to those restaurants that were most likely to have hygiene violations? So, for example, you might have the hypothesis as an inspector that a seafood restaurant is a riskier place to eat on a hot summer day. And that's because it's super important that the food is kept at a cold temperature. So can we use that kind of knowledge to create algorithms that help prioritize this list for our inspectors? So we took the historical violation data from the city of Boston and we combined it with a new data set. And this was donated by Yelp, and it was the Yelp reviews of those restaurants. So it's things like the star rating, what kind of cuisine it is, what hours it's open, uh, and actually the text of the reviews themselves as well. Uh, and we had competitors build an algorithm that used that Yelp data to predict which restaurants were going to have hygiene violations and how serious those violations were going to be. Uh, and so that's been great. It's really exciting. The city of Boston is actually implementing a test right now where they send some inspectors ba out based on the algorithm and some based on their traditional process. And they're sort of having competition to see who finds more violations. Uh, and so that's just one example of sort of in the civic technology space uh, of the kind of ways in which you can use data uh, to really have an impact. Absolutely. That's very interesting. Is is that competition, it's closed, but it, can people still go on, on your website and check out? Yeah, so actually, uh, one of the things we do with the competitions is every winning algorithm is open source. So we publish on GitHub all of the code of the winners of the competitions. So that's available to anyone who wants to look at it. Right. Uh, and also, Yelp has a great academic data set program. So the Yelp data is actually available for research and learning purposes through their website. So if you look for the Yelp academic data set, you can find it for lots of cities around the United States. That's really cool. Uh, so we've ascertained and seen examples of um, the fact that case studies and actually getting, getting down and dirty with real data sets is incredibly important. Uh, in Python in, in particular though, I, I suppose each person has their own set of packages and libraries they really like mm -hmm. to use for, for data science-y stuff. Mm -hmm. what, what are your preferred packages and, and, and libraries and modules? Yeah, so really um, Pandas is one of the workhorses that I rely on day to day. Um, it's the ease with which you can manipulate data in Pandas is amazing. Uh, and even doing more complex things like time series uh, can be really effective. Um, Scikit-learn, of course, is another huge one uh, that has basically all of the machine learning methods that we might want to use. Uh, recently, we've been working on some deep learning projects, and so we've been working with convolutional neural networks, uh, and the Keras package in Python is a really great API for accessing computations on top of TensorFlow or Theano. Fantastic. 
Um, and do you have a preference between TensorFlow and Theano, or is there something you work with more often? Uh, I work with TensorFlow a little more, uh, but I don't have a strong preference between yeah. the two of them, yeah. Great. Um, so, in terms of what you're working on now, are there any super interesting or super frustrating challenges you're, you're finding in, in, in your working life? That's, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that we constantly find is that uh, the data never looks like you imagine it does in your head. So I talk to you about a problem you're having. You're like, oh, we're collecting X, Y, and Z. These are great things. We've got them in a database. It's, it's going to be amazing. So can you just build us a model that does this? Uh, and then you get the actual data. And really, part of your role as a data scientist is to look at that data very skeptically and say, OK, how is this actually collected? What am I missing here? What, what can I see in this data that is actually an artifact of how it was collected or stored rather than something that's actually going to give my model some signal? Mm. Uh, and so really, that critical thinking part of cleaning data uh, is one of the things that uh, I come up against every day. OK, yeah. Um... So <clears throat> a number of students will, will say there are certain barriers to becoming a, an effective data scientist. For example, I've heard people say, I don't know enough linear algebra, I don't know enough calculus or statistics. Can you speak to if these are um, particular barriers? And if so, how people who don't have that type of expertise could, could surmount them? Yeah, well, so there's no question that the basis of so many of these algorithms that we work with is linear algebra and statistics. Uh, so in some way, if you want to construct algorithms, you really need a fundamental understanding of both of those things. However, you can become a, a what I like to think of as sort of a work backwards data scientist. Rather than starting with statistics and linear algebra, you can start with these implementations of these algorithms. You can say, OK, all I know about this algorithm is that I use it in this particular case and it does something for me. I don't know what's happening, but uh, I do know it's the right tool in this particular case because I've learned that, because I've heard that from people, because people who are experts told me that's the way to approach this problem. And then eventually, as you start doing that more and more, you start to understand what tools are being used you sort of get drawn into more of the statistical back background, more of the mathematical background, and build up those intuitions about how those systems work, sort of from the top down, rather than being a linear algebra whiz first, and then understanding how to construct models on top of that. So it's really on a need-to-know basis when you want to dive deeper. It, it definitely can be. I mean, I think that uh, it's sort of a natural process for a data scientist to to have that curiosity, to want to dig deeper, to understand how things actually work. Uh, but as you say, it, it's something that comes up every day in your work, right? Like yeah. part of what's exciting about being a data scientist is you get to learn something new every day. Very much so. Uh, and so. And use search engines. And use search engines, yeah. I mean, which are great examples of the success of data yeah. science, right? Very much so. Fantastic. I would all, I, so I agree with everything you, you just say. I'd also urge, uh, people who are trying to learn some math uh, to not be afraid of notation or to understand that That's everyone great. is scared of notation. Like you look up, you know, PCA on, on Wikipedia and suddenly you've got all these, you know, sigmas and matrices and all of that. So don't, don't be scared or realize that it, that it, that it freaks everyone out and well, there's, there's a learning curve. Let me make a recommendation then. I, I don't think that Wikipedia is the place to go to understand a mathematical technique. Wikipedia goes very deep very quickly in a way that is not effective for learning things. So if you actually need to learn parts of these things, uh, you need to find um, materials that are designed for people who are learning. You need to go find that course online that gives you that, the background in linear algebra. You need to go find a textbook. You need to go find uh, a technical book about the topic that you're looking at. Mm. Because Wikipedia will scare you away immediately. There are topics that I know about, and I go to the Wikipedia page, and it says things I don't understand. It gets freaky. It does. Two, two or three things popped, popped into my head then. The, the first is, you know, you can always jump on Quora or Stack Overflow and say, hey, I don't get this. Can anyone give an intuitive explanation of yep. it? 
actually, before you do that, look up intuitive explanation of so and so, and it will probably someone may have up. answered it. Yeah. My second thought was, yeah. Once we finish this interview, we should jump on Wikipedia and start making some edits to. That that's a right? great that's like that revolutionize Wikipedia ma- mathematics by first giving like some pages do have an intuition, but first giving you know not all the no- he- notation heavy stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, just to, to piggyback real quick on what you said, uh, I do think it's really important that people who have questions go out and ask them online. Don't be scared to ask a Talk question. Yeah, don't be scared to get on Stack Overflow or Quora and. Uh, make that community a community of experts and a community of learners. Um, so really, really don't be afraid of it. Uh, get in there, ask your questions, don't be ashamed. Everyone's a learner at some point. Uh, and the fact that you had the question means that someone else probably has it. And that answer being there for someone else to find is going to be a huge win for them. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think I'd, I'd, I'd also say, being an educator myself, the best educators I've, I've learned from and worked with are constantly learners than, than mm-hmm. themselves. Uh, so having said all that, uh, I've got one, one last question for you. Great. Uh, I'd like probably the strongest piece of advice you have for as- aspiring data scientists. The strongest piece of advice I have is to work on real world problems. I mean, it's, we've talked about it throughout this interview, um, but really that's where you learn the most because so much of data science happens in those edge cases, right? It's how to know with this strange problem that happens every now and again in a certain data set. That's how you become an expert data scientist, is saying, hey, that's something I've seen before. This isn't something that happens in every data set. This is something that happens in particular data sets, but I know what to do. Uh, And so really, just by working real problems over and over again, you'll put tools in your toolbox that let you handle each of those situations as they come up. Um, So really, I try to do one thing from start to finish and then move on. It doesn't have to be perfect. I just want to have started with raw data and gotten to my answer at the end of my process. And I don't, I don't need to know everything that happens in the middle. It doesn't need to be perfectly written code, but I've understood a lot through that. And then I can move on to something else and learn something from a new data set. Fantastic. Words of wisdom from Peter Bull. Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure. Great, thanks Hugo, I really appreciated it.